Uh, welcome back to A Little Faith. I am Levi, and I am here with Sister Betty Winfrey. How are you doing, Betty? I'm doing fine, thank you. Good. Thanks for taking the time to talk with us today. Um, we're, we're, we set up this conversation because uh, the Rise Up and Build uh, program, which is kind of the uh, the WCF uh, program that tries to encourage ecclesias, existing ecclesias, and um, and uh, share kind of best practices and uh, help our ecclesias uh, grow and stay healthy. Uh, the Rise of and Build program has a quarterly initiative coming up, which is um, talking about uh, encouraging our members to host Bible classes at work or school. So we're going to talk about that because your name came up as someone who has um, some experience in doing that. And we're going to talk about that. Um, so, so let's start with uh, who you are. So where um, where do you where do you live now? Um, um, <clears throat> I live in Fairfax, Virginia, where I've lived for some time, and I go to the Arlington Ecclesia, which I've attended for some time also. Nice, yeah. For, for anyone who doesn't know, or maybe isn't from this country, Arlington is uh, kind of right outside of, of Washington D.C., so it's the Northern Virginia D.C. area. Um, so where do you work now? Well, I work at Fairfax County, um, where I have for some time, and uh, I still work there <clears throat> part-time. What, what work do you do for the county? I have worked in uh, IT, and I guess I'm still really in IT, but I'm more of a coordinator between a user department and the IT group, so I'm sort of on the fence working both, both sides. That's interesting. So, yeah. How long have you been doing IT for the county? I have probably been doing it about 45 years or so. Oh, wow. Where the other, yeah. So you've seen a lot when of... When I was a kid. When you were a kid, sorry? I started off as a kid. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, you've seen a lot of technological advances then. In yeah, that, quite a bit. Quite, in that, quite a bit of change, yeah. Yeah, yeah I started yeah. off when I was 21. What drew you to computers? went like this. I was in high school and I'd spent a lot of time doing homework in the classes that I was in. And I just kind of came to the conclusion that if I went to a four-year school, I'd really have trouble keeping my priorities right. And I'm not saying that I did end up doing that. But um, so uh, somebody in my class who was to be honest, is a little bit poor. She had signed up to go to Northern Virginia Community College, was going to take computer programming. I thought, well, it's not retail. Mm -hmm. It's <laughs> um, it's it's uh, not the medical field, which would have been all right, but it sounds like something where you need to do some thinking. So I really kind of went into it a bit cold, to be perfectly honest. And back then, it was probably a pretty limited segment of the population that had much of an idea about it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That, it, um, I, uh, I don't know exactly how old you are, but if you, but getting into computers, you know, 40, 50 years ago would be a very different world than computers now. It, how long, and how long has it been that you've been working for the county? All right, let me do the math. Um, I've been working for the county, um, Actually, 51 years. Oh, wow. I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there was a, a, an estimate. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so we're talking today about, I guess, hosting Bible classes at work. Uh, when when did you first start doing that? Um, I think I was just 21, maybe close to 22 years old. Oh, wow. And we, we lived, we worked in a bullpen area. Back then, uh -huh. you didn't have all these private offices. And I heard, I always felt like, and I had talked to some of my friends at high school about the things of the truth, about the Bible. And um, it, it just happened at work that I overheard um, two of the ladies there talking about some biblical question. And I asked them if they'd be interested in meeting together to talk about the Bible, well, or the particular question that they were working on at the time. 
do you remember when you met? Like what what when what time during the week or whatever? Like what was the, how did the first start? Uh, we met at lunch hour mm -hmm. consistently um, for the main class. Um, it probably varied according to the time period, but there were weeks where we met. Uh, I think Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and sometimes Friday too. There are a couple people that I would meet with when they got more interested with either early in the morning over breakfast or um, one or two people came here and we talked in the evening. So it kind of varied. Yeah. Yeah. And um, we were talking before we started recording and you're still meeting, you're meeting with another individual now outside of work. You said that person's retired. Right. Right. Have you been meeting with people basically off and on over the 50 years? Basically, but it got, it got to be, I would call it, you know, somewhat of a, a drier spell, but thankfully um, there, you know, at least recently anyway, for the past four or five years, it's been somebody to meet with. We had, that might've had a break for a time. Yeah. When people retired and moved on, but. That's it. Yeah. It's interesting. So, so, and you told the story about kind of your, your first class, uh, mm -hmm. how would others come to join you? Do you have other stories like that? Oh, well, that was the first one. Um, another thing we did um, for a time was to put up a note on the bulletin board when that went under the wire okay. Right. After time, we couldn't do that. Uh, so we did it that way. It kind of happened by word of mouth. People know, as you know, <laughs> they hear that you're interested in those kinds of things. So if they happen to have an interest, um, that's what happened with at least one person, a couple people, they asked if they could join. And then one person came on a dare. Huh. <laughs> so are there any, did, did anyone ever get baptized? I guess that you could, I wouldn't ask you to wouldn't ask you remember everyone you ever met with, but um Yeah, I actually I'd never counted before, but um when I um did an initial conversation with somebody else, it, I count out ten people got baptized out of the class. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. So and then the, more importantly the, is the ones that it dominoed to. You know, the more that it dominoed to. So and so talked to so and so who talked to so and so. You know, that's something yeah, what, I don't even think are, I'm up front. No, yeah, definitely not. Uh, what are some of the names that you, the people that came to? Uh, well, there was a Janice Ryan, Rich Sorrell, Carolyn Jenkins. Those three have actually passed away. Sharon Hill Wilson, who also passed away. Lorraine Yake, um, Darlene Herndon, Lynn Quitmeyer Malo. Um, Mel Wells. Um, I'm forgetting somebody that's terrible. But oh, yeah. Those are well, some of the names. Yeah. I knew, I knew it was a dangerous question to ask. Yeah, it is. We obviously don't want to offend anybody. Don't want to offend anybody. Yeah. yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. I mean, uh, like you said, considering the knockout effects, especially uh, Sister Sharon, she was a mm -hmm. um, had an effect on a lot of people. Yeah, it's it's an interesting. I mean, I, I guess we're telling we're telling the story to to kind of inspire others to uh, to make to kind of make these same decisions. And I think there's a lot of ways to go from here, um, because like, and well, let's go here first. Like you said, it, it's gotten it's definitely gotten harder at work to be. I mean, because of culture and changes, you know, le really legal changes made in the workplace. Like you're saying, you, you, it, I don't think anybody would be able to post on their bulletin board that there's, that they'd like to meet with a Bible class, but, but it's also, there's nothing wrong with people having lunch together and talking about whatever they want to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, yep. I've always been in a funny spot because um, I've worked at the same company for 13 years and which is an United agency's insurance. And it was actually founded by uh, Chris Delphi and brother, Bob Lloyd. And we have, 40 employees total, but a lot of the people in the leadership positions are Christadelphians. Mm -hmm. So we've been now 
there's only seven Chris Elvians out of the 40 people, but we're in, I'm in a position where I've never been able to even, you know, to be public at all. You know, even if, even if I was to ask someone to come to join a Bible class, it might be called discriminatory or, or favoritism or um, whatever. So my, my workspace particularly is tough, but, um, but I mean, anyone has the opportunity. If, and I think, uh, Another thought is, you even there in your first story, you overheard someone talking about it and entered a con and entered that conversation that way. You know, that's kind of that would feel more natural than kind of posting a po posting a poster and saying, you know, come and talk to me about the Bible or something. I had one person too that called me. In fact, she's the one I'm talking to now, and I, I don't know where it will go, but she called me one day, and we had not really talked, but she knew I was religious. So she said, Betty, will you pray for me? She said, I've got this court trial coming up. It's a murder. And she said, I just can't stand the thought of listening to what I'd have to listen to in a murder trial. I said, sure, I'd be glad to do that. And then I followed up and said, um, what would you think about the two of us getting together and maybe studying the book of Esther? Thank you so much for inviting me, which was so uh, neat. It's really nice to hear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. But not necessarily typical. No. Yeah, I'm wondering, I'm trying to think if, you know, if people would be af afraid to, to ask people to, to meet with them. What, what would, what's something you would, is there anything you would want to say to someone who, who would say to you, like, oh, I'd be too nervous to ever ask about doing the Bible readings together or something. Let's say you, you pray about it. Yes, you may be nervous, but in time, you'll get comfortable and be really glad you did. Mm. That's a good answer. Also, like you said, people, p p your, your coworkers knew you were religious, right? So Somehow, yeah. Yeah, but you need to, we need to be sure that we're living in a way at work that makes that obvious, right? Um, right. What we already talk about, or what we do, or what we don't do. And I'll be honest. When I was twenty-one, I felt like so much of it depended on me. Mm. And did I really prepare? And I think that's important. It is important. But as time went along, it just became so obvious to me that God had done so much work in these people's lives. Um. Before they came there. Right. I think you're, you're just a little step along the way. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. I mean, yeah. it, is, it is important to be clear and to be kind and at the appropriate time, tell it like it is. But mm -hmm. um, we, we're only part a little part of it. And, and God works so much, I think, in people's lives. So. Yeah, that is so true. We can... Um... Yeah. We can get confused and I think maybe human pride or even pressure can enter in like, like it's somehow our responsibility to save people. Right. And it's, it's not, that's all God's God's work. It's just our responsibility to, like you said, be kind to people, be open, be ready, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, we also were talking before there's a, there's been a couple other your your story is a, is an amazing example, and you know, thinking about all the people that are still members at Arlington and other ecclesias that relate back to, you know, through some string or some knock on domino effect to uh, to you holding classes at work. There's um, there's a couple other stories we were you and I were sharing about the Minneapolis Saint Paul ecclesia. Um, also also traces back to Brother John Peak, who was working at 3M. Um, and held classes through the 60s, and many people were baptized. I asked Brother Horst Trustet for some names, and he shared Dave and Ann Swan, Arden and Celine Larson, Roger and Carol Lang, uh, Jeff and Isabel Nicholson, there's, and there's others. Um, I, I asked him to follow up on some other families, and he actually he actually hasn't answered yet, so I know there are others. And another story, also in the 60s, which is coincidental, in the San Francisco area, there were there were two brothers who were who were brothers in the flesh as well, um, Ted and Bob Sleeper, 
and they both held classes at their universities, Ted at UC Davis and Bob at uh, Berkeley University, or, or Cal, as it's called. Um, and some names from both of those classes was um, uh, Brother John Warner, Art Kirsch, uh, the Amendolia family, David Levin, uh, Brother John Laban, um, Brother Marco Dondero, and there's many more. Again, these are just kind of the names that that uh, uh, Brother Randy Tyra is who sent me those names, and he um, he's also on that list. And those <coughs> the names he sent back to me this morning. So it's interesting that again, like you're saying too, some of those some of those people have gone on to have large families in our church, in our church, you know, many generations of of, uh, of believers which is amazing, you know, that, that the, from those one, from that one ask or that one uh, time together, many, many people were, you know, given a chance at salvation. So, yeah, it's, it's something that I wonder, you know, how do, how do we encourage more of that? How do we encourage more of brothers and sisters? I think um, Jessica's dad, my wife, uh, Jess, her father is Phil Sweeney. He would host, classes in his at his work uh, for many years um and he would just ask for bible readings that's what he would say he would call it a class per se right he would just say specifically let's do you want to do the bible readings with me at lunch you know mm -hmm. which is a good i think that's a good low pressure way to ask yeah we typically a lot of times we study we started by studying genesis then it would veer off into other things later on but that's can seem like pretty neutral ground to start with. Right. Just kind of get people's feet wet. Yeah, that's a good idea. And that is the beginning. Yep. <laughs> and it kind of kind of does start answering the question of how did we get here? Where, you know, where, mm -hmm. where is this all from? And and actually I didn't mention this to you up front, I don't think, but I heard about John Peake's class and that actually just hearing <laughs> about it encouraged me. To, mm. to think about it myself so yeah interesting yeah that makes sense i mean you, it wasn't like you're the first one to ever have the idea i guess but yeah, you it's like this this can this can happen yeah it can work it yeah um i'm sure there are other examples too that i mean in 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 north america that i just don't know about i just know about i knew about those too because that's essentially full ecclesias like the St. Paul ecclesia still exists today and there's there's two ecclesias in San Francisco that both have members that are from those classes um that still exist today you know which is amazing that's 60 the 60s is 60 years ago <laughs> that's a long time ago we need to be people that people know as religious you know without without turning people off you know so you can't you know, it's not, you don't want to so stay on a soapbox in the middle of the, in the middle of all the cubicles, you know, but you, we do need to be a person that people know as religious. And I think the way I've always done that is I ask people what they did on the weekend and they say, you did this or that. And then I say, well, I did this. And then I went to church on Sunday and here's, and, you know, I'll share some detail about church. And right now I say that my four-year-old loves her Sunday school teacher, which is true. We're very blessed by the sister who's leading her Sunday school class. Mm -hmm. And Pippa looks forward to Sunday school so much right now. Uh -huh. It's just wonderful. It's that's, that's a huge blessing. But um, so I share that with my I share that with my coworkers and with my clients as well. So I do a lot of face-to-face -face meetings with with clients, and I'll tell them you know what I did on the weekend and that my that my four-year-old loves Sunday school and. It's, I think it's like a, it's a very safe way for me to, to signal, you know, that I'm a religious person, I guess. So yeah, I would encourage, encourage anyone to, to do things like that. You know, don't be afraid to bring it, bring that up. Cause especially, you know, with the times we're in, I think that lots of people are wondering, you know, what's, what's happening, what's going to happen. Yeah, and at a minimum, you can say there's a better day coming. Right. I don't think it's going to be good in front of it, but there's a better day coming. So, yeah. So some people want to pursue that. Other people's was just say, I hope so. Yeah. So. Yeah. Or they'll say when the other guy gets elected, there's a better, better day coming. You know. 
Yeah. You were mentioning like at um, St. Paul and maybe out where you live, it's been families. In our case, it might be only one individual from a family, which is tough. Mm -hmm. But like, okay, there was a mom had a son that came to Sunday school after she started coming. He taught one friend. That friend taught another friend. Mm -hmm. That friend taught his wife. And so while it's not, you know, all from one, a couple of families, there's still that, you know, just that domino effect that we were talking about earlier. Yeah. I mean, and even in our own cases, I don't know, um, yours necessarily, but, you know, for us, it was somebody introduced them. It was uh, with my grandmother. It was somebody that moved next door to Richmond. Uh-huh. With my grandfather, with somebody way back up further up the line, that knew, you know, Brother Thomas. With uh, my mom's family, it was um, her aunt by marriage. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you never know. Yeah, our story. Well, the st- I actually don't know the story of the how my family on my mom's side originally found Christadelphians, but the story of, on my dad's side is is an amazing story. So it is back in the late. It's in the 1880s, so Brother Thomas and Brother Roberts are still active. I guess Brother Thomas has recently passed at that point. And in Montreal, Canada, and my great-great-grandfather, my grandfather's grandfather, so that's great 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 my, my, my Calvin, Calvin Gillino's grandfather was working at a shoe factory um, he was not religious, but he was a gambler. Ooh. So he had a gambling problem and, uh, he would get his payday paycheck and he would gamble it away. And he came in on, and it was December and he came in on, you know, came in and whatever it was working the next week. And he actually was crying at his desk, crying where he was working. And the uh, manager comes by who was a Christadelphian. And says, "What are you? What are you crying about?" And he said, "Well, I, I, I couldn't stop gambling again. I lost the money, and I won't be able to buy the kids Christmas presents this year." And he's and the manager said, "Okay, if you can find Christmas in the Bible, I'll give you a dollar, which is a lot, like a lot back then. I'll get a dollar, which is enough to buy the Christmas presents. If you can find the word Christmas in the Bible, I'll give you a dollar." Huh. And so he went home. And he said, because he played him because he he said that because he knew he was a gambler. And if you can't find it, you give me a dollar. So I'll take it. Christmas has to be in the Bible. So my great great grandfather went home. He spent all night, you know, didn't sleep looking for the word Christmas in the Bible. Obviously, there's no internet. They can't, there's no strongs in court. You can't find it. He doesn't find it. He says, You swindled me. He came back. You swindled me. I can't believe it. You know, fell for that, fell for it again. Christmas isn't in the Bible. And he said, I know that. I knew it wasn't in the Bible, but I'll make you a deal. You don't, you, don't, you don't owe me a dollar, but if you do your Bible readings with me from now until Christmas every day, as I guess now I'm realizing telling this story, it's actually similar to holding a class at work. <laughs> it's a little, bit, <laughs> yeah, it a little bit of a different start. <laughs> you have to do the Bible readings with me every day, and I'll give you a dollar uh, for the Christmas presents at Christmas time. And he said, okay. And then they never stopped. They did the Bible readings for years oh, after that. that. Well, that's great. Yeah. It's, and I, I guess, yeah, I never thought about it now until having this conversation. That's probably, a, uh, you know, the the, the Jelano family all came from a class at work, too. Well, so, hmm. yeah, it's a fun one. Well, thank you so much for your time. I think, uh, I think uh, hopefully it inspires someone to, to do. Ask, ask someone to do, do the Bible readings at work. Yeah, I mean, we we have a treasure. I think we, some ways, we know what a treasure we have. In other ways, we're shy about it. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. So yeah, that's a that's a good thought to end on. Uh, so thank you, Betty. Okay, thank you, Levi.